Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number 41 of series 5. Uh, the question this evening is, is personal identity more dependent on facts, consciousness or values? Again, my reading uh, from one of my works, if you want it, uh, the, from The uh, Pursuit of Value, Chapter 1, Section 4. And again, my underlying question is, what can we do with our lives or human existence as consciousness? So, in this last section of these workshops, we've been discussing how values are expressed in the world. In the middle section of these workshops, we discussed how value might be a principle of life as the will to value. So in, in the first section of these workshops, we discussed theory of mind and consciousness. Last week, we discussed love and self-love and asked the question, what is the particular aspect of the self that is valued? This raises the classic question of personal identity that we will discuss today. That is, what am I? A body, an animal, a rational being, a conscious being, or a value-created being, or something else. Firstly, the question of personal identity raises the distinction between psychological and philosophical accounts of the question. In psychology, the question, who, are, who am I, resonates from ancient Greece to Freud as the, as the injunction, know yourself. This task might involve observing oneself, recognising aspects of oneself in one's unconscious, as well as being um, honest, having insight, or perhaps psychoanalysis. The philosophical approach is different, although there is some overlap, especially with existentialism. But the existentialist approach is about creating oneself with choices rather than discovering oneself. The classic philosophical approach is more about discerning key features of personal identity. But there's an overlap between psychological, existentialist and philosophical approaches. This is because we can choose to affirm psychological and philosophical views of ourselves. Before discussing the philosophical approach to personal identity, we need to examine how to identify physical or any kind of objects. Various methods have been employed that might or might not be applied to personal identity. Now, Plato determined, um, entity, uh, de uh, determined um, identities through his theory of universal forms and essences. That is, everything has a perfect counterpart or model in another metaphysical realm. For example, the existence of dogs is sustained by a perfect counterpart of dogness in another world. But the idea of a two-world metaphysical dualism has been rejected by modern thought and philosophy. Aristotle determined identities with a notion of purposes as well as with fixed <coughs> essences. But again, we don't believe in um, essences and define things with overt characteristics such as size and mass. We do use purpose to define things like a hammer, but we acknowledge that we um, attribute this purpose. It's not something residing within the object itself. But for um, Aristotle, purpose is, um, in, in, is inherent to an object. For example, the purpose of a stone is to bury itself deeper into the ground. Christianity took on Aristotelian metaphysics and um, essences, using it to explain things like transubstantiation. The question of personal identity might want to retain the idea of essence in the form of self-consciousness. But as we'll see, this is challenged by non-Cartesian 
theories of consciousness. With Wittgenstein's complex theory of meaning that rejects single defining criterion uh, poses another problem. He gave the example of games having no single defining cr criterion. A more topical example is race. But he regarded, or Wittgenstein regarded, language as a form of life with complex, overlapping and entangled meanings. This is a linguistic argument against anything having a fixed essence, including consciousness. But we might consider con consciousness as a special case, as we will do shortly. The question of physical, ident of physical um, identity nevertheless remains ta tantalising with many enigmas and paradoxes. Nurath's boat, for example, was said to be rebuilt at sea one plank at a time, and did it return to land the same boat? In another version, the boat is rebuilt on land, and all the old parts are put back together to make another boat. Which then is the original boat? We can solve the problem perhaps by stipulating what we mean by original. But then we have the problem of a stipulated or an arbitrary identity. What is it then that determines the different identities of two anatomically or um, atomically identical objects? Is it location in space and time, linguistic designation? Is it a function of the observing consciousness? Is it its continuity of, it, of its um, existence? Or is it its co constituents? Leibniz's principle of indiscernibles offers some clarification here. That is, if X is um, identical to Y, then every property of X is a property of Y and vice versa. Or more simply, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. These problems become more complicated when trying to define personal identity, which has a unique self. Standard features of name, gender, age, family, ethnicity, culture and personal hip history seem inadequate here. Yet nearly 400 years ago, John Locke identifies personal identity with consciousness. And in the archaic and convoluted language of the 17th century, Locke writes that, quote, that with which the consciousness of this present thinking thing can join itself makes the same person. Well, yes, rather, rather, com, rather, convoluted, rather convoluted, but nevertheless um, defining um, identity in terms of consciousness. But in the 18th century, David Hume famously said, when I search for myself, I can never find myself as a self. But Hume seems to think of himself as another object in his field of perception, whereas he is the um, originator of his field of per perception, like an eye that cannot see itself. But that doesn't mean that the eye does not exist. This leaves Hume's denial of self in a rather anachronistic position. So we should um, examine various other ways and means of defining and determining personal identity, such as psychological features like memory, the body, a phenomenal self, or a value-creating being. So we, will, so we will now look at locations as the body, the memory, and the phenomenal self, and as value. The idea of personal identity, as determined by the body, has different levels of refinement. Most basic is the physicalist, I am my body, without reference to personal hip history or self-consciousness. This means to be, this seems to be the means of self-identification of um, animals or perhaps 
extremely unreflective people. Yet self-identification need, need not be an absolute, but can involve various you know, different means. For example, Merleau-Ponty extended Heidegger's being in the world to needing a body to be in the world. He held that much knowledge is acquired and articulated through the body. Motor skills are forms of knowledge that are structured around the body, such as in sport or speaking. With regards to sport, the British used to say the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Or today we could say driving isn't just an unconscious habit because we can drive in many novel circumstances. So we are talking about identity as consciousness and um, intelligence expressed in the body. And Max Vellmans also places consciousness as personal identity um, in the body and in various locations in the body. For Vellmans, consciousness is found in inner experiences and bodily sensations. In bodily sensations, he writes, some experiences appear to be located on the surface of or internal to the body. And inner, you know, inner um, experiences such as verbal thoughts, images, feelings of knowing seem to be in the head. And a lot of metaphors, ancient and modern, also point to consciousness being identified with parts of the body. The stomach is sometimes referred to a second mind due to its large number of nerve endings. Body, me body metaphors include having guts, cold feet, lily-livered, lily li stiff-necked, having heart and the breath of life. The point is that identifying with the body isn't as crude as it might have first seemed. Now look at the widespread view in psychology, philosophy and the media that identity is constituted by memory. Films like Blade Runner, Instant Recall and Star Trek employ the idea of memories determining identity. Also, total memory loss through accident or disease is often cl clinically associated with loss of identity. Cases of disrupted me memories and disassociations of time pe periods raise um, issues of ethics as well as um, identity. We can then ask to what degree should an old person be held responsible for his actions as a teenager? And can a total amnesiac be held responsible for actions of which he has no inkling? Questions of personal identity as memory thereby raise ethical um, issues. But the idea of personal identity as memory is challenged by Barry D Dainton's notion of the phenomenal self. Dainton contrasts the phenomenal self with the psychological self as the locus of identity. Dayton, Dayton explains his notion of a phenomenal self with the fictional idea of teleportation. People are reconstituted as data and reconstructed exactly as before down to every neuron and memory. They believe themselves to be the same person as before, that is, their psychological self. They think they are the same person because they have the memories of the previous person. But Dainton and others suspect that teleportation would be a form of suicide because the phenomenal self would not have the same phenomenal um, identity as the previous person. We can refer here to the above examples of mistaken you know, um, identities in film and other stories. Dainton's notion of the phenomenal self 
makes two interesting points. One is about the nature of personal identity. Another seems to show a widespread neglect of the phenomenal self as an aspect of self-consciousness. This neglect is seen in the theory of physicalism, in the identity of clones, in discussions of AI and in other places. Saul Kripke also makes an acclaimed argument against physicalism from unique personal identity. Dainton's work also underlines often um, overlooked, strange, uncanny and mysterious um, aspects of personal identity. Personal um, identity is the property that allows questions like why am I here and not there and not then or me and, and not another. This is because my um, identity is the entity that I am at the centre of my circumstances of time, space and my body. I am only here and I could only ever be here. If I were somewhere else, I would be someone else. Yet a challenge to personal identity comes from the idea of fission or a radically divided, divided consciousness. Evidence comes from split brains, fragmented personalities, schizophrenia and other considerations. The idea of fission or a radically divided consciousness is explained in another Star Trek story. The first mate of the starship um, Enterprise, Will Riker, is, de is teleported to the surface of a planet. But something goes wrong. Riker's atoms and molecules are unknowingly du duplicated. Some years later, the new Riker meets the old Riker. There are some personality dif differences, but we can't tell who is the um, original and who is re replicated. They both have unimpeachable claims to the memories, history and the identity of the former R Riker. This poses problems for personal identity as body, as memory or personal uniqueness. Paul, Paul, Recur, Paul Recur finds further dimensions of personal you know, identity to add to those of body, memory and consciousness. He poses both a collective identity with other people and a narrative identity over time. He also poses both an identity that never ch changes and an identity that remains the same. Recur holds this sameness of identity, responds better to the question who rather than what. The Recur further held that the question of what I am gives way to the question who 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 I am, I'm answerable in terms of value. For Recur, these are internalised values discovered in social, political and ethical relations. So Recur answers the question of personal identity in terms of values, concerns and, um, and um, aspirations. But why does Recur locate personal identity in value rather than in consciousness or the phenomenal self. We might say that consciousness alone has no material content, that is, it must be conscious of something. And consciousness as cognition or a fact may be insufficiently substantive. So personal identity may have to be determined by value at least in practice. The idea of being, the idea of being ultimately um, identified, you know, um, identified by one's values is, um, you know, is um, attractive and has um, affinity with my own views about value. But the ideas of phenomenal consciousness and personal v values compete as criteria of identity. Yet there seems to be a way of synthesising 
consciousness and value. That is, in the view that consciousness and value are intimately related or mutually coexistent. In fact, phenomenologists identify consciousness as value and regard value as a constituent of consciousness. Heidegger cites care as the being of Dasein and Sartre writes that the being of the self is value and that reflective consciousness cannot arise at the same time without disclosing values. The existentialist emphasis on freedom and choice also offers clarification of this identification. Freedom is a precondition of at least moral values as well as of the possibility of choosing to be yourself. Sartre writes, to choose is to affirm the value of that which is chosen. And freedom, choice and value are properties of reflective consciousness or the phenomenal self. And together, these properties of consciousness provide the basis of personal identity. <clears throat> these identifications of personal identity with value by recur Heidegger and Sartre may appear th theoretical, yet a more visceral expression of value as personal identity can be found in religion. To, uh, to explain this, we can note Furbach's projection theory of religion in which God expresses two things. One, mankind's highest value, and man himself projected outside of himself in the form of a divine being. For the believer then, human identity is bound up with divine identity as value. And religion is indisputably a febrile expression of values, feelings and human identity. Explicit identification of um, identity, feelings and values is found in New Testament texts such as For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Matthew 6.21. So I'm citing religion as an expression of personal identity and value and, and um, identity in God. In conclusion then, I first outline a few problems of um, identifying any object, physical or conscious. I then looked at some criteria of personal identity, like the body, uh, the, the uh, memory, value, and the phenomenal self. The phenomenal self is an aspect of consciousness which has intimate relations with value. So I try to answer the question of personal identity in terms of my two key concepts of consciousness and value, because one, consciousness, is central to human existence as personal identity. And two, value is an essential aspect of both consciousness and personal identity. Yet my conclusion is that personal identity is a complex amalgam headed by an executive phenomenal self. This comprises a physical self, a psychological self, a social self, and an evaluating a phenomenal self. So let me have your quick criticisms and co comments on websites like meetup.com, Philosophy of Value w Workshops.